And at the time the Lord walked the earth, the Rome, uh, the uh, power of Rome governed the entire area. Uh, they were very sophisticated. They valued education, culture, the arts. They had a, a Senate form of parliamentary government. They had an emperor. And so there were many things about the power of Rome that stood, but we often think of Rome from a military sense. They were the unbeatable team. Uh, if you look at all the territory that Rome took over, Rome conquered easily. And they did something very wise, and that is as they conquered a people, recognizing that the people's customs and religion would be different than Rome, they allowed those they conquered to continue with their religion as long as they added, added worshiping the emperor as God, add this God, the emperor, to your list of other gods. At this time it was very common for not worshiping the one true God unless you were Jewish. They were in the pagan world, they were worshiping multiple gods. So it would have been okay if you're a pagan to add one more god, and now that would be the, the emperor of Rome. With Rome coming into all of the Mediterranean came some good things. They had a very elaborate road system. Uh, on my way here, uh, I stopped in Rome for an afternoon, uh, had a chance to visit the Pope, not really. I visited the Vatican. I don't think there's a better way to begin the Reformation course or Reformation study without visiting Rome. All of the things that the Reformers contended with are still true today. They haven't changed. And as you go back in time, you could even if you visit uh, Rome, you would see what would have been known as the Appian Way. Some of their road systems were so good with solid foundations. They were master architects. Those roads still are ex in existence today. They, be they built beautiful structures. This is a water distribution. Um, um, how would I best put that? Basically, they delivered water through this type of a structure. Uh, their architecture was exceptional. They governed a large, large number of people. If you see the red here, this is in the first century. This is where Rome rules. This is the remains of the Roman Forum. This would have been, uh, as buildings fully outfitted, what Paul would have seen. He would have walked these very streets. If you were in Rome, uh, it is held to believe that where he was kept prisoner is off this way down below in a kind of a cellar jail basement jail. But with Rome came persecution to the church. And persecution to the church didn't just start then as it did for the Reformation, many of the martyrs in the Reformation. But the persecution came because Christians were largely misunderstood and held to be heretics and those in opposition to the Roman government. So many of them gave their lives for truth, standing by their belief in the one true God and His Son. And so many of them were martyred in the Colosseum. Persecution lasted for several centuries. It was stronger with certain emperors who had a hatred for Christianity. Sometimes you had an emperor that was more um, congenial to Christians. So persecution came and went. But in, a t there we go. in the time of Constantine the Great, uh, you would know of the city Constantinople, it was named after him. But Constantine the Great, as emperor of Rome, won a major battle that cemented his power and his position. And he won it because he had a vision the night before the main battle that he saw the sign of the cross. And that's his side of the story. He asked his soldiers to put the sign of the cross on 
their clothing, their shields. They went to battle the next morning. They were greatly outnumbered, and they won. So he believed it was the God of the Christians that had helped him to win the battle. And so now as emperor over Rome, he made being a Christian fashionable. He appointed people in his government who professed to be Christian. So the Christians, the real Christians, went from severe persecution to now being, this was something everybody wanted to say they were Christians and it was acceptable. It also brought Christian worship out into the open, and it was with Constantine's rule that church buildings were first formed. So, a lot of times if you read about Constantine, you will read that he was a Christian emperor. Let me just help you with this, and this will be very short. There's no evidence he truly knew Christ as his Savior. He was under the false impression that he won the battle because of the sign of the cross. But he lived his life in the same pagan fashion he had before. But the one good thing for Christians during his reign is their persecution did end. When Constantine dies, persecution comes back. So Rome is a powerhouse. They are strong, formidable, for two to three centuries. And as you, you know, think, I think I had to make sure I had the right slide. As you go forward into history, into the 4th and 5th century, suddenly Rome begins to crumble. The foundation cracks. There are oppositional forces inside the government and outside in the lands that their power over the Mediterranean begins to falter. And so there's a variety of reasons. I encourage you to read the bullets that I have here on the screen. Uh, one thing about Rome, since it wasn't a Christian nation, is that there was tremendous immorality there. Uh, homosexuality, it was not uncommon at all for a Roman man to have multiple mistresses and concubines and his own legitimate wife to bear him legitimate sons. But the immorality was, was everywhere. And many historians, especially Christian historians, as you look at Rome, realized they really decayed from the inside because of the moral problems that they had. But there was inflation. Uh, as time went on, they hired mercenary soldiers to do their fighting. And they did not have the same heart in battle or the desire to be in a faraway land for as long as they were expected to be. Rome begins to crumble. When Rome crumbles, the church, the Roman Catholic Church will emerge. Now, it would be helpful to understand that in the process of Roman rule, the government declining, that Rome, which had been a very powerful city, suddenly begins to be attacked frequently. And the bishop of Rome, Leo, who they consider to be uh, the first pope after Peter, he steps out into a major offense surrounding Rome when Attila the Hun comes to really the gates to Rome. It is the Bishop of Rome who goes out, pays him a large sum of money, and Attila the Hun turns around and leaves and does not come in and sack Rome and destroy Rome. That had become common practice. And so the Bishop of Rome suddenly gains popularity and the people of the city are so very grateful. But something else happens. The spiritual leader now becomes a civic leader, becomes ultimately a military leader. And this is where the formation of the Pope having the power he does began. When Rome fell, the government, the church, the Roman church steps in and fills the void. Now I am shrinking down a lot of key events just to kind of get us to where we're going to go. This isn't by any means a complete history. But it lets you know that Rome was in power, Rome declined, and the church, the bishop of Rome, ultimately becomes where the, the papacy or having popes comes about. 
At this time, too, there are some heresies that emerge that will show back up in the Reformation. I want to point one of them out to you, and then I'll give you another in just a second. Um, there was a monk, a British monk named Pelagius, and Pelagius did not believe in original sin. He believed babies and children were born as a blank slate that ultimately later in life they would decide whether they would be good or evil. Now that is in opposition to what the Bible teaches us, that we are all from Adam sinners and that yes, born in our flesh we are sinners. So Pelagius has success initially and then there is a council that the church brings together and defeats this thinking. But there's forms of Pelagius theory in his thought, known as Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism, that will resurface in the Reformation. So I just want you to know that the heresy of Pelagius, which came about in really the mid-fourth century, will resurface. Now, when Rome falls, as I said, the Bishop of Rome steps forward, becomes the hero, and thus is born the hero of the church and now the people. There's one other uh, thing that happens in this time frame, the early first centuries, and that is that Jerome, a monk, spends about 40 years of his life in Jerusalem and makes a translation of the Bible from the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin. Now you think that would be a good thing, but his translation into the Latin has severe discrepancies and deficiencies, and this translation is what the Roman Church has used, will use, for the next 1,000 years. And so I wanted you to be aware of this because the uh, Bible in Latin is not a great translation. It, it has deficiencies. This will come back in, especially to Wycliffe, and especially to William Tyndall, and we'll see that in the next couple of days. Now, so, how does the church now, as it has emerged, the power of Rome as a military giant has faded, now the church has emerged as a powerhouse, and yet by the 6th century, all of these heretical things have crept itself into the life of the church. Uh, because Rome took over so many different cultures, Rome the military, um, taking over other cultures brought about pagan worship. And a lot of the pagan worship has now found its way into the church itself. Again, remember, every time I say church, I'm referring to the Roman Catholic Church. And these will be the early days of that Catholic Church. They begin to have prayers for the dead. You and I know that when the soul departs from the body, they will eternally be either in hell or in heaven based upon what they did with Christ in this life. There is no praying someone out of hell or in the Catholic mindset, praying them out of purgatory. More on that later. The Mass or the Eucharist, you and I call it the Lord's Table, is not just a memorial. It now becomes a place of God dealing with your sin again. A re-crucifying, if you will, of Christ. They begin to worship saints. This will be a problem in the Catholic Church throughout, it still is today, where they worship saints to an extreme degree. Um, we worship Christ. We're grateful for saints. But they worship saints. They will ultimately pray to saints. Uh, probably the most notable one being Mary. Uh, they begin to worship relics. These are items that the church deems to be spiritual value. Uh, in a lot of the reading on the Reformation, it, what comes out is that the church placed spiritual value to material things. Um, when we get to Luther, you'll discover that he's in a town where the governor of that area uh, that he actually works for had 20,000 
relics are pieces of things that might have held value to the early church. Pieces of the cross, nails from the cross, a lock of one of the apostles' hair. They even uh, believed they had Mary's breast milk there. Um, just, it's, it's kind of sad where, where they took this, and you'll see this repeated over and over again, things that you just are shocked by, that the church not only taught, but they held people accountable to. Uh, they would worship images. Uh, they would take on vestments or clothing to where their priests would look a lot like Old Testament priests. One of the great confusions of the Catholic Church is they believed they really replaced the Jewish uh, you know, tribe. and, and uh, uh, They look a lot like Old Testament priests for a reason. They have dead rituals. And then there is a movement that begins called monasticism. And this is where many of their priests would be so fed up with all the silly things we just read that they decide to just go away into the hills or the mountains or cave and try to get away from everybody and just be in solitude. Uh, it is a church with enormous doctrinal error. Now, with that comes, after this period of darkness, you now have the dawning of the Reformation. Um, there is known in, uh, as you look at history, there's a time period known as the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages. There's a reason they're known as the Dark Ages, is that truth, the truth of the scriptures, has been suppressed, taken away. It is a time of enormous ignorance as to what the Bible says. So any interpretation of what is genuine salvation, how does a man be right with God, that's what troubled Luther. Uh, we'll learn more about that uh, this afternoon. Um, but just have to remember, it was a very sad time in the history of the world. And it lasts about a thousand years. And this is the time period in the late Middle Ages when John Wycliffe will emerge. But if you would, just read the bullets here. Uh, it is a, a time where death is all around you because of the bubonic plague. Black Death, as they called it, just kept circulating through Europe. There are times and places during the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, where as many as two-thirds of a village would die from the plague. So you are surrounded by death. There are short lifespans. You are superstitiously religious, or your, your religion is one of complete superstition completely in error. It's a time where in the church, the church doesn't provide a whole lot of help. Because in the church itself, you have untaught priests. Many of them may have purchased the right to be a priest. Oftentimes, a rich landowner would want his son to be a priest. All you have to do is give the Catholic Church a certain amount of money. And your son is installed as a priest. It didn't matter that he didn't know Christ, didn't know the Bible, knew nothing of that. He now becomes the person who would be responsible for the souls of the people in that city. It is a very sad situation. It's a time of darkness. It's a time where the treasures that you and I hold dear, the Bible, an understanding of the grace of God, the kindness of God, the mercy of God, God is seen in the Middle Ages as angry. Uh, many of the pictures, if you go back and look at some of the artwork then, especially even of Jesus, he looks like he's having a bad day. Uh, and, and this is the way that it, life is depicted to these poor souls during this time. The church also gets something else wrong. In Matthew 16, the Lord asked Peter, who do you think I am? Who do you say I am? And Peter responds with, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord says to him, Blessed are you, Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now the Catholic Church believes that that rock, what's Peter's name mean? Rock, stone, pebble, 
And the Lord actually uses a bit of a play on words here. He, when he refers to Peter in this passage as a little pebble, he, in a sense, didn't signify, Peter, you're anything here other than the truth you just gave, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the truth that the church, that's the rock, the boulder, that Christ's church will be built upon. But the Catholic Church believes that Jesus was talking about Peter. So Peter becomes, in their tracing of popes, Peter becomes the first pope. So they give glory to Peter and all subsequent popes, believing that that's what the Lord meant. If you get this wrong, they built an entire history out of error and heresy and, and just doctrinal confusion. So, as we look at the Reformation, what are the key issues that the Reformers will have with the Church of Rome? There are many, and I'm giving you here a short list. Let me review this. First and foremost, the Catholic Church believes the Pope, who they call the Vicar of Christ, is Christ's representative here on earth. And in fact, as you continue on in Matthew 16, Christ gives in a sense the same understanding we have in Matthew 18, is that the church here on earth will have the opportunity to understand, in a sense, who are true believers, the keys to heaven and hell, meaning by response to truth, we'll understand who, who is going to heaven and who is not. They interpreted that to mean that the church has been granted the right to determine who will go to heaven, who will not. In the Reformation, you will find that many times the Pope will excommunicate these leaders, the leaders within the Reformation. And when you are excommunicated by the Pope, that is essentially the Pope taking your name off the list for heaven. And that would have been a very desperate thing. But remember, this is a time filled with error filled with superstition, filled with the belief that the Pope really was that all-powerful. So when a Pope speaks, he speaks with infallibility, just like Christ. Church traditions and councils are considered to be equal to the Bible. I would probably rephrase, this was my own slide, but I'd probably add to that that one of the errors in the Reformation is that the church and their interpretation of Scripture or their reliance on Scripture is in such a way that the church is above Scripture. That's why councils that would meet over the centuries or different traditions that are created or teachings of the church which come from the Pope, the Cardinals, as they meet together they determine what is truth. And so the church sets itself up and in a sense judges what is right to be taught from the Bible. Rather than the Bible governing the church, the church governs the Bible. It's a massive heresy, massive heresy. But that's why as you look more closely at Catholic theology, you scratch your head saying, how did they get that? Well, it comes down through the ages that sinful men come together and determine that. They create this thing called purgatory. They worship Mary. Uh, it was in 1850 in one of the councils that they finally determined that Mary was as immaculate as Jesus. And then you have prayers to Mary where they're asking Mary to go talk to her son about their salvation. It's just a gross distortion uh, of truth and so sad. They come up with, as a church, seven sacraments. The simple way to understand this, it begins with baptism, it ends with final unction. But it's your pathway to God. Because they will take a Pelagian view of how a man is made right with God. And here it is. Men cooperate with God to secure salvation. It's not a moment in time where you come and bow the knee to Christ and repent of your sins and, and come to Him as Savior. It's not a saving moment. It's a saving lifetime. And it, again, it will hold the people that the church is over in bondage. Priests act as a mediator for the people. You want to be nice to your priests. He could do bad things to you in heaven or keep you from heaven if they decide to take you off the list. 
But there is corruption, both monetarily, in the way that they exhibit their power, and so often the church is filled, filled with immorality. It, it is just a terrible state. But, good news. This is a Latin phrase that means, after darkness, light. And one of the more fascinating things about this time we call the Pre-Reformation, when John Wycliffe will come on the scene, is that he stands really alone in what he will accomplish. And we are so grateful for him. As we introduce, there's the definition, after darkness light. That really becomes the phrase to describe the Reformation. You've had this thousand years, these dark ages, of darkness being truly the best description. And now there's light. And it's the light, as Phil talked about this morning as he began our time, it is the light of the Word of God. And so now, John Wycliffe emerges. A little bit about John Wycliffe. Um, he emerges in the 14th century as a brilliant Oxford scholar. Um, he was an outspoken biblicist. He defied the church and all these heresies we just read about and uh, that we've been talking about. But more importantly, John Wycliffe translated into early English a version of the Bible that came from the Latin it was all that was available to him at the time. And so this is Wycliffe's life. I'll let you take a look at uh, his timeline here. But the Bible that Wycliffe will translate is better than no Bible at all. And we're careful not to criticize what Wycliffe did. But if the only thing available to him was the Latin Bible, which was a poor translation, in many places from the original languages, then that will just be carried on because you now have a translation of a translation. And so it will have some problems. But it will be Wycliffe who passionately believes we need to give the Bible to the people in their spoken tongue so that they can read the Bible for themselves. They can evaluate the practices of the church. They can know God's truth as best they can and that they can also present the gospel to others. It's interesting how um, Wycliffe came to Christ. Uh, he is at Oxford, and one of the people that played a huge role in his life in understanding a gospel of grace, not a gospel of works as he had been trained, but a gospel of grace, was uh, this gentleman at Oxford, Thomas Brandwardon. And he was known as uh, the profound doctor. He was a brilliant scholar himself. And he was the one who understood salvation is of God's grace. It is a work of God, not a work of man. And so he leads John Wycliffe to Christ. Now, what are the issues that Wycliffe will put a spotlight on? And this irritates the church. Uh, transubstantiation is a big word. Um, it basically means this, that at the time of the Eucharist, or the Mass, that the priest has the power to convert the bread and the wine into the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so the transubstantiation becomes a centerpiece doctrine because Christ is being re-crucified over and over and over again every time a Mass is held. Now that will fly right in the face of Hebrews 10, where we understand that Christ and His offering was one time complete, sufficient, comprehensive, and He sat down at the right hand of the Father. Salvation our atonement, propitiation for sin, all took place at the cross for all of eternity. There's no need to reapply, reapply 
what took place at the cross. And yet the church has done this. Let me give you an aside. There was a famous criminal in the United States named Al Capone. Have you heard of him? During uh, the Prohibition times in the 20s, Capone was the most notorious criminal in all of the United States. It was impossible to bring him to justice. He had an intricate way of hiding a lot of his sin. Uh, he was involved in uh, the liquor trade, prostitution, gambling, even the early introduction of drugs into America. He was a terrible criminal. They couldn't get a witness to be alive long enough to go to court with. Uh, Capone would make sure they were killed. So here they stand, they know him as a terrible criminal. They can't do anything about it. Somebody got the idea that he's making all this money, which he did. We can get him on tax evasion. He's not paying taxes on that criminal money. And that's ultimately how they got Al Capone into prison, was tax evasion. Not all the other crimes he had violated. It was tax evasion. And that's why he went to prison. How does that link itself to transubstantiation? When reformers were martyred and executed and persecuted, the Catholic Church's way of getting them was that they did not believe in transubstantiation. In other words, uh, the reformers had different views of what was taking place in the Lord's table. Martin Luther had one view, Zwingli had another, Calvin had a, even another. But they didn't believe that sins were being paid for again. And the Catholic Church did. And this became the way, like Al Capone's tax evasion. This is what sent most of the reformers to their death, is that they would not assent and agree that transubstantiation was real. That's how the church did it. So the crime against the church, the crime against the state, because that was very much one then, was that they did not believe in transubstantiation. You have the sale of indulgences. Here, if you pay the church money, this even took place in Wycliffe's day. Pay the church money, you'll get forgiveness of sins. You have a host of priest abuse, prayers to saints, loving saints. Instead of worshiping the Savior, you're worshiping everything but. So this was brought to light by Wycliffe at this time. You can imagine that the church did not let this go by lightly. And they were anxious to silence Wycliffe. But he was such a great preacher. He was known as the flower of Oxford. He was a beautiful, beautiful speaker and used the word of God as his centerpiece. The other thing that happened here is as the Catholic Church took on its power, all across Europe, whether it be kings, or nobles, you ruled in your land under the permission of the Pope. Remember what took place with the Bishop of Rome turning back Attila the Hun? Well, the Pope now emerges just like the Emperor did in Rome, under a military sense, a civic sense. The Pope now is the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and it spreads across, across all of Europe. So a noble would have to pay tribute, he would have to pay money to the Pope every year and to initially buy his position in as, as whether he's a king or a duke or a noble. And so in England, they have let decades go by without paying the Pope. And the Pope is very upset and he has commanded that King Edward come to Rome to give an account for this, primarily to pay it. Edward refuses, and they have to decide who they will send to defend England's right to not have to pay, or at least pay a lot less. They choose John Wycliffe. It was Wycliffe's position that the church had no right to do this, and he became a hero, loved by the people. He became a hero because he was a defender that there was no need for the land, England itself, to pay tribute to Rome. As a result of that, um, he is brought before a trial 
of his Catholic peers, or the church peers. They wish to silence him, and the people are behind him, and he escapes. Um, he, is, he spends almost three decades at Oxford, and is sought after as a speaker, preacher, teacher, professor. He writes a great deal. Um, he becomes really a, a hero to the people. But the church will not let this go by. All the things that he has spoken out about has offended them. And so the church will look to silence him, and they put pressure on Oxford to release him. When they do release him, and ultimately uh, find themselves agreeing with the Catholic Church to put him away, he takes a church, Lutterworth, and this is again by the hand of God, very opportunistic. <laughs> Because he's later in his life, in a few years he'll be dead, and he uses this time to create the Wycliffe Bible. And he translated, in the, the time that he went to Lutterworth, he translated 750,000 words in, from the Hebrew and the Greek, which are from the, the Latin translation. He creates the Wycliffe Bible. Um, finally, those that could read would now have a copy of God's Word in their hands. This is a time where Bibles were copied by hand. One single Bible took ten months to copy. It was painstaking work. Uh, in many cases, if you ever get a chance to see pictures, of Wycliffe Bibles. They are works of art. The beauty in them, but again, they were copied by hand. Here is a full 1385 edition of Wycliffe's Bible, and it is now worth in U.S. dollars $2 million. Uh, there's only a few of them in existence. But remember, this is, uh, this is a copy of the, um, the Latin, and even with that, he is able to put the Bible into the hands of the people. He also, um, let me let you see one of the translations. This is a time period where the English language is not yet formed, certainly not in print. There's no dictionary. And in many ways, words are sounded out, uh, and the pronunciation is really sought after. You can see the same person. Uh, write a word, spell it differently, be the same word, because the, again, the language is not under formation yet. Uh, and he will help that process along, as will William Tyndall, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But the church reacts. By burning every copy they can get. They now take Wycliffe's writings, and anything produced by his hand, pamphlets and tracts, they will burn them to get them out of the people's hands. It's also interesting to note that at this time, while Wycliffe was alive, they had something called the Begging Friars. And the Begging Friars were essentially priests who made it their habit to go and beg from the people for money. They wanted to look uh, very sad, very dour, they wander the countryside basically taking handouts. And they use as their basis for this that Jesus was a beggar. That was their understanding. Remember, they're not taught well. That the apostles and disciples were beggars. And so we as priests, we should be beggars too. Wycliffe made it his absolute life work to put these people down and communicated to everyone who would listen just how abhorrent and ugly the practice of begging friars uh, was. They weren't about the, the pathway to help people. They were more about just taking money from the people for their existence. So Wycliffe was really very, very outspoken against them. And he fell sick one time. And when he was sick, they thought he was going to die. So some of the begging friars came to him to try to convince him that he needed to apologize to them 
say that he was sorry for all the ugly things he had said about them, so that it would be right with him in heaven. Well, the only thing it did was I think it gave him the spark to get out of bed. Had they not visited, he might have died. But uh, he really, that was just, that was the medicine he needed because he rose up and finished uh, his, his life work. One of the great things that happened in, uh, in Wycliffe's life is that he trained a number of young men in the right way as shepherds, as evangelists, to give God's message of grace, very different than what they were hearing, God's, God's mercy is now presented to them that salvation is a gift. The people had not heard this. And so he gathered together young men and they became known as the Lollards. There's a variety of, of ways that people have interpreted what the name meant. Some believed it was the word mumbler because the Catholic Church didn't like what was coming out of their mouth, which was a message of salvation very different than the Church was teaching. And so they, in a, uh, in a negative way, would say they're just mumblers. But these young men traveled all over England. They went up into Scotland, into Ireland. They even went to continental Europe. And these were godly young men with a message of grace, a message of the gospel. Many of them carried with them a small New Testament of the Wycliffe Bible, or pieces of it. And the Lollards play a big role in preparing the people in these faraway places for the gospel message for what will come in the Reformation. Well, Wycliffe dies. He, uh, he dies uh, on New Year's Eve, December 31st, in a church service. They carry him out in his chair. It's known as the Wycliffe chair. They carried him out, and he died that night from a stroke. Well, the Catholic Church, um, some three decades later, finally at the Council of Constance decides that they're going to deal with this guy, Wycliffe. And they go dig up his bones, and they burn them, and they excommunicate him. Well, wouldn't that have been confusing if you were in heaven for 30 years, and all of a sudden, where'd Wycliffe go? You know, the Catholic Church just bumped him out of heaven. It's, it's ridiculous stuff, believe me. Uh, burn his ashes. As How much did that hurt Wycliffe? Probably not much. Um, but he is remembered as really uh, the morning star of the Reformation. And where they get that from is the morning star is actually the planet Venus. And right before the dawn, it emerges and is seen as a very bright star. And so Wycliffe will set the stage for what will come. There's the Wycliffe chair. He will set the stage. Let me go back here. He will set the stage for what will happen, uh, especially with uh, William Tyndall and what the other reformers will do is they themselves begin to translate the Word of God now from the original languages. Um, and so produce translations which are pure to the Hebrew and to the Greek. Now there's one other person that emerges in this time frame and that is Jan Hus, John Hus, as we say. And uh, this is now in Bohemia. And he would have been a disciple of Wycliffe. And you say, well, how does this happen? He's, he's living in what was then Bohemia, now Czechoslovakia. And so how does Hus himself find out about what Wycliffe is teaching? Well, Queen Anne, or Princess Anne, rather, uh, in the royal family of Bohemia, in one of these royal weddings where there are alliances that takes place between different countries, different regions, uh, they marry into each other to try to satisfy disputes or to be, be friendly with each other as nations. And there is a Bohemian princess who marries uh, really the King of England. And with this now, it opens the door for many of the young men studying in university to come from Bohemia to England, to Oxford, and to study there. And many of them that come to the University of Oxford while Wycliffe is alive, go back home with many of Wycliffe's writings. Jan Hus was able to take advantage of this. He responded aggressively and positively to what he was reading about with Wycliffe. Um, he begins then in Bohemia, 
to preach against the very same things that Wycliffe had preached against. This is the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. Um, it was the habit of the Catholic Church to not conduct their services in the language of the people. Uh, it was in Latin. So if you were a peasant and you went to church on that Sunday, you had no idea what was happening. You looked up and you saw a priest in all the guard with bells and whistles and smoke and incense and conducting the mass and all the chants, the different things. It felt holy. You had no idea what was going on. But this is what you have to do. What Huss does is he begins to preach to the people in their own language out of the Bible. And it draws crowds before, you know, people are, uh, you know, having to go to church, have no idea what's going on. Now they're hearing the Word of God preached, and he would preach often. He would pack out Bethlehem Chapel. Over 2,000 people would crowd in. This is before they used chairs. And 2,000 people would crowd in. But he is preaching in the language of the people. And they respond well to it. Well, the Catholic Church doesn't let this go by. And they decide to put Jan Hus on trial. He is uh, commanded to come to a council, the Council of Constance. And he goes, he's told that even though he differs from the church, uh, the church has all these charges against him because he's preaching, just like Wycliffe did, a message of grace, of mercy, uh, that the people understood. He's assured that if he comes to Constance, that he will have safe passage. He won't be harmed in any way. Just come and give an account of what you're teaching. Well, he voluntarily goes, and it's a trick. They put him on trial there. And within a short amount of time, they decide he is a heretic, that you wouldn't need to honor your word to a heretic. And so, yeah, we said uh, you're going to come under peace, but they took him prisoner. Uh, they humiliated him there in front of all those who attended the Council of Constance and uh, made him wear a, a, a dunce hat uh, that branded him as a heretic made fun of him, uh, and very, 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 very quickly, right there at the Con Council of Constance, they take him to the flames, and he is martyred and persecuted on July the 6th. And uh, when he dies, oh, I keep going to the wrong page, sorry. When he dies, he makes a statement, Hus, in the language of the day, meant goose. And uh, he was a Hussite uh, from, and he was actually named after his town. Um, and so he uses this funny phrase, here he is about to be executed. And he says to the crowd, today you cook a goose, but in a hundred years a swan will arise and you won't be able to kill. Well, Luther took that as him. And so oftentimes when you see Lutheran material, or uh, pictures associated with Luther, you'll see a swan. Uh, Luther was, uh, one, of, one of his characteristics was to not be overly humble. Uh, and he thought, Huss has got to be talking about me. So, so he gladly took that charge. Uh, the people of Prague, I'm missing a, uh, a slide here. It's in my book. Uh, but if you go to Prague today, <coughs> you will find in the city square, a beautiful statue of uh, Hus looking towards the church. And uh, the people of Czechoslovakia, the people then adored him because he brought to them the clear, simple message of the gospel. Uh, after he dies and is executed, and we will go to the next slide, uh, Jerome of Prague emerges, again very much one who loved Hus believed all that Hus did, and he began to preach, do the exact same thing. And then we find that uh, the Catholic Church <laughs> tries him and executes him as well. So I think as time goes, I have five minutes left. <laughs>
And so, um, you get a you you get a bonus five minutes. I get a bonus five minutes, yes. But let me do this. Um, this these both Huss and Wycliffe are known as pre-reformers. They set the stage, and what will come next as we go to Martin Luther will officially be into the 16th century, and I'll go over Luther's life. But these two men, with limited resources, were faithful and true to the gospel message. The response was amazing. So they planted the seeds to the Reformation, and we are grateful they did.